Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Debbie's passion is for you to understand and apply God's truths to your life. Now let's listen and enjoy teaching from the Word of God with Debbie Blank. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Lord, every moment you give us on this earth is for your purpose and your glory. We forget that a lot. We think it's about us and our lives. Oh, but it's about you and what you would have for us and what you would have us do for you. Father, help us in our jobs to put you first, in our families to put you first, in our country to put you first. Help you always be the preeminent focus of everything that we do. I think of Billy Graham, he used to say he prayed, he, he followed scripture that says pray without ceasing and he prayed all the time. Some people say, well, how can we do that? We just live our lives for Jesus, and that's a prayer and an action, and that's what you call us to do. I pray tonight as we just hear some history and learn a story and understand family dynamics a little bit, that you will also show us how we can know you and know your will in our lives, because oftentimes we ask that, and we want to know what your plans are for us. I pray that as you show them to us, we will obey you. Because obedience, as you say, to obey is better than sacrifice. So knowing isn't enough. It's following that puts the meat on the bones. Tonight, help us to know and to follow. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let's begin tonight by opening up the Bible, Genesis 45, 9 through 11. We've walked through the story of Joseph, how Joseph was, take, was sold into slavery to Egypt. How old was he? 17 years old when he was sold into slavery. When he became a slave, what did he do? What was his job? He was in charge of everything that Potiphar had. And Potiphar was a major man in Egypt at that time, a leader. And he was in charge of everything. Everything that, except, of course, Potiphar's wife. What happened to Joseph in Potiphar's house? <laughs> yeah, he lost his coat. <laughs> well, he lost his cloak for sure. He'd already lost his coat. Uh, because when he was sold into slavery, by the way, what did his brothers do with his multicolored coat? They dipped it in blood and took it back to their father. Did they tell their father what had happened to Joseph? No, we were talking earlier about lies, and that's a lie of deception or omission. They let their father believe something that was false. They knew the truth. They knew what their father was believing, and they didn't say anything. We'll see, we'll get a little glimpse of that as we go into tonight's lesson of how they ended up having to suffer for that. So Joseph now has been sold to Potiphar as a slave. Potiphar's wife seduces him. Did Joseph succumb to that? What did he do? Or what did she do? Yes, she accused him of it because she had his cloak. He ran out. She had his cloak, and she accused him of trying to sleep with her. So instead of killing her, killing him, which is what Potiphar should have done, he had him put in prison. How long was he in prison? Thirteen years. So he was 30 years old when he came out of prison. How did he get out of prison? By the way, he probably would have been there the rest of his life. How did he get out of prison? That's right. He had interpreted dreams of two of Pharaoh's servants, but once the one got back to Pharaoh and was back in his good graces, he forgot to mention Joseph to Pharaoh until Pharaoh had a dream. Nobody could interpret it. So then the, was it the cupbearer? The cupbearer remembered Joseph and brought Joseph before the Pharaoh to interpret dream, the dreams. Did Joseph interpret them correctly? He did. What did the Pharaoh do? And not only did he interpret the dream to say there would be seven years of famine, and seven years of plenty, and then seven years of famine, but what else did he do? 
Yeah, he told them what to do to make sure the country would have grain, how to store it and what to do and to put a man in charge and all this. And the Pharaoh was so impressed, he puts this 30-year-old in charge. You know, when I grew up, you didn't get to be prominent until you were at least 50, maybe even 55 or older. You really had to work to make a name for yourself. Nowadays, they're putting young kids in charge of things. Uh, that just blows me away because they don't have the life skills yet, but they do have the ability and the wisdom, and so they're put in charge of major decisions. I mean, I look at uh, J.D. Vance, who's the vice presidential candidate, and he's younger than both my kids, and that makes me <laughs> really feel old <laughs> to think of that. But anyway, um, so Joseph then was put in charge, second man in charge of all of Egypt. Now we came to the point where he's, they've had the seven years of plenty. They're in the time of famine. They're in their second year of famine as we continue in Genesis 45. So how old does that make Joseph? You were right the first time. 39. Because he was 30 when he became in, char in charge, second man in charge of Pharaoh. Seven years of plenty and now two years of famine. So he's 39 as this is taking place. His brothers have come down to Egypt to get grain at two different times now. What did Joseph do in this last time that they were there? Well, yeah, they, he put the money back in their money sacks, gave them the grain, put a cup in Benjamin's bag to test them again. He wanted to find out if their hearts had changed, and it had, so he finally told them who he was. Now he's going to request that his family come down to Egypt. That's where we are as we start Genesis 45, 9 through 11. Joseph says, hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. When he's saying that, is he being arrogant? What's he What's his purpose of using those words? God has made me Lord of Egypt. That's very good. So that his father would know that they weren't walking into some kind of trap or some place where they were going to be persecuted. Uh, that Joseph really did have authority to do the things that he was going to be saying he did. I don't see any arrogance here because he doesn't say, look at me. I'm second in charge. He says, God has made me Lord. He recognized God in everything that he went through. Do you? If, you? if you were in prison for 13 years for something you didn't do, if you had been sold into slavery for something, then you hadn't done anything wrong except being kind of an arrogant little kid, but, um, or at least not having the wisdom to not irritate your brothers, would you have the attitude of being humble before God and recognizing God and seeking him? Whenever we go through difficult times, we always have two choices. Follow God or get angry and mad and do things our way. Which is the best? I'd say which is the better. There's only one way to follow God because he has a purpose and a plan. And he promises us in Romans 8, 28, God causes all things to work together for good. All things for those who love God for those who are called according to his purpose. If you don't love God, you don't know how things are going to work out. So Joseph is there. He's saying to his brothers, bring back my father. You shall live in the land of Goshen. You shall be near me, you and your children, and your children's children, and your flocks and your herds, and all that you have. There I will also provide for you, for there are still five years of famine to come, and you and your household and all that you have would be impoverished. Now think of that. If you're talking about family, and we're going to learn later that that's 70 members of their family, but not just them, but their flocks and their herds. Was Jacob wealthy? Yeah, remember all the herds that he had when he left Laban's house. When he married Leah and Rachel and left his house, he had these herds, and it only got larger and more, but they didn't have any place to graze. There's a famine. There's no, nothing to, for them to eat. I looked at the grass outside about a month ago and thought, oh, I love that time of year. Everything's so green. And now you can tell we're in the end of July. 
because it's all starting to get brown. And that's how it was there. There was nothing for them to have eaten. They would have starved. There's no way that they could have bought enough grain in Egypt consistently and taken it back home in order to survive. Joseph knew that. That's why he said you would, you have would, and all that you have would be impoverished. He knew that. Now I go back to Genesis 15, 13, because there God made a promise to Abraham. He said, then God said to Abraham, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for how long? 400 years. So God told Jacob's grandfather, Joseph's great-grandfather, in effect, they'd be going down to Egypt and they'd be there for 400 years. I, I wonder if Joseph knew that. Or if he did, I wondered if he realized that this trip to Egypt was going to be that time. But going to Egypt is a fulfillment of that prophecy that was made in Genesis 15. So I, I put a map together. I'm not sure, if, for those of you who get PowerPoints, I'm not sure if those uh, names came across right. But I wanted you to see where Hebron is up in the top right. That's in modern-day Israel. It's still called Hebron in Israel today. That is where Jacob and his family lived. We will read here in a minute that he, draw, he goes down to Beersheba. That's an important place because God spoke to both Abraham and Isaac, his fathers, in Beersheba. And then he will end up going to Goshen. That's where Goshen is. If you, I've, has anybody ever been to Egypt? Have you been to this area at all? Goshen or, or that area that would have been Goshen? Is it near Cairo? I don't have any idea. Um, but if you look at the Nile Delta, this is just at, on the eastern, southeastern side of the Nile Delta. The Nile Delta is going to produce water. And it's going to produce fertile ground <clears throat> because there's plenty of water to fertilize it. So there's plenty of places for all the animals to graze. Perfect place for them to be. And it's away from the Egyptians because the, the Israelites were odious to the Egyptians. Shepherds were odious to the Egyptians. So this kind of put them in a different part of Egypt that they wouldn't be running into the Egyptians all the time. Perfect place for them to be. Now it goes on to tell us, Joseph said, Behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother, my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth which is speaking to you. In other words, you may not believe this is me, Joseph, but it is me. So you, when you go tell your father, you're going to tell him that it's really me. You've seen me. My brother has seen me. Now you must tell you my father of all the splendor in Egypt and all that you've seen. And you must hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. What does that show you? What does that mean? Great love, great joy to see each other again, great respect for one another, and healing. That's right. Benjamin didn't have anything to do with Joseph being sold into slavery, but still there needed to be healing, healing for the whole family, and it started with Benjamin, but it didn't stop there. In verse 15, it says, Joseph kissed all his brothers and wept on them. And afterwards, his brothers talked with him. So he showed forgiveness to them. He showed love to them. He showed that what they did, he knew God had a purpose for, and he held no bitterness for them. That's a great question. I had that same thought. And so I somewhat measured it on that map. And it looks to be about 200 to 250 miles. That's a long journey. It's not one that you want to take every month to go get grain. When you drive to the grocery store in five minutes, they had to spend days and days, weeks maybe, going in that direction, even with camels and donkeys. So it was a long way. It was an easy one. Now this passage ends by saying, 
he kissed all his brothers and wept on them and afterwards his brothers talked with him that's a unique saying why why would it tell us that his brothers talked with him had his brothers spoken with him before Okay, they had spoken through an interpreter and they had only spoken to him when spoken to to answer questions or to explain about the money in the sacks. But now they're on a different level. They're on a brotherly level, not a master level and a foreigner level. They're on a brotherly level so the brothers could actually talk to him probably in Hebrew. What an intimate time that must have been. And how freeing for the brothers to be able to do that and see him as, uh, you might say, their peer because he was a brother. And it also tells me that they must have seen Joseph's forgiveness, or at least part of it, because they were willing to humble themselves and build that relationship again. That's We talked a lot about that last week, about that, about forgiveness. It doesn't always end up this way. We can forgive people. We can try and make amends with people. It doesn't always end where we are on a good footing with them. Our responsibility is to be faithful and do what God's called us to do. We cannot control how anybody responds. But in this case, we see a great response. It tells us now in Genesis 45, 16 to 18, now when the news was heard in Pharaoh's house that Joseph's brothers had come, it pleased Pharaoh's and Pharaoh and his servants. Now his brothers had been there before. Why is this time different? That's right. He acknowledged to the brothers and obviously to other people that they were brothers. The other time they didn't. Nobody acknowledged that Joseph was related to them. He didn't acknowledge that to them. So this is different. Now the Pharaoh knows. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this. Load your beasts and go to the land of Canaan. Take your father and your household and come to me. And I will give you the best of the land of Egypt. And you will eat of the fat of the land. Wow. This is a time of famine. There's no food. There is no way that they can get food except coming to Egypt. And he's not only saying he's going to give them grain he's going to feed them he's going to provide for them and give them land free land in Egypt what a blessing that shows how much the Pharaoh respected Joseph so speaking of Pharaohs I did some research and this is controversial quite frankly but it appears that the Pharaoh who appointed Joseph as second in charge was Sanusert Sanusert the second and the one that we just read about who encouraged Joseph to bring his family down was um, Sanusert the third different pharaohs that means that Joseph not only had gained the respect of the first pharaoh but of his son also and the son was obviously very favorable to pharaoh when we move into Exodus chapter 1, for those of you who have read it, do you remember what it says about a pharaoh? It says there arose another pharaoh who did not know Joseph. Let me read it. I think that's pretty much exactly what it says. Uh, there arose a new king. Uh, no, excuse me. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. So by the time the exodus was going to come 400 years later they'd totally forgotten what happened with joseph and that all they knew is that they had a bunch of jews over here living in goshen and they weren't egyptians they didn't remember joseph now the exodus from egypt is supposed to have taken place give or take around 1425 or later a little bit earlier than that which would put thutmos the third in charge now some people some people say it's Ramses because of the way that the Bible talks about the city of Ramses, but that would have put the Exodus a couple hundred years later, and I don't think time allows for that as you study scripture. So anyway, the point being is these are different pharaohs. This is not the same pharaoh who put him in charge, who's still in charge when he says, bring, bring your kids down and your family down. 
Joseph had an excellent reputation. It wasn't a one-time thing, but he had spent now, well, 39 from 20, 19 years honoring the pharaohs in what he did, and they saw that. We're told then in Genesis 45, now you are ordered, this is the pharaoh, do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. Do not concern yourself with your goods for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Then the sons of Israel did so and Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh and gave them provisions for the journey. As I read that, I saw two words that jumped out at me. One is ordered, and the last one is commanded. The Pharaoh was adamant, absolutely so sincere about everything he said to Joseph that he demanded it. It wasn't just a, oh, hey, Joseph, go bring your family here. He commanded it, he demanded it, and he provided all the provisions they needed so that they could bring them down. Now, with uh, Jacob having all that he had, he would have had enough camels and donkeys and wagons to bring the families down, but the Pharaoh wasn't going to count on that. He wanted to make sure they came down here. He was honoring Joseph for what Joseph had done for Egypt. Here's a foreigner who gave of himself to save Egypt during this time of famine. So now Genesis 45 says, to each of them he gave changes of garments, but to Benjamin he gave what? 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. You know, I read that and I think, gosh, anytime I want something, I just go on the internet and buy it. They didn't have that option. They literally wore the same clothes all the time. So to get a change of clothes would have been quite prestigious. And I wondered, what kind of clothes did they give him? You know, if you're a farmer, you wear jeans and overalls and things like that. If you're a socialite, you wear fancy gowns. Well, different mentality. In Egypt, you wore different clothes than you wore out in the farmland or out in Canaan. So who knows what kind of clothes, if you gave them Egyptian clothes because they were going to Egypt. But the point is, he honored them. He not only forgave them, but he blessed them with something that was very unusual to have then, which is a change of clothing. And of course, to Benjamin, he gave him extra. 300 pieces of silver. That's a lot. I don't know what silver is going for right now, but it's probably about 70 or $80 an ounce. So that would have been thousands of dollars, our money that he gave to Benjamin. It goes on to say, to his father, he said as follows, 10 donkeys loaded with the best things in Egypt, 10 female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and sustenance for his father on the journey. So he sent his brothers away, and as they departed, he said to them, do not quarrel on the journey. So uh, Joseph here is making sure that they have more than enough of what they need to get them home and to get them all back to Egypt. Because that's a lot. To have 10 donkeys loaded with grain, that would last them a while. But the curious thing is the very last sentence. When Joseph says, do not quarrel on the journey. What would they quarrel about? What is there that's going on that, that would cause them to get in a dis disagreement? What? <laughs> yeah, it could have been the I told you so stuff. We shouldn't have done that. But actually... What they should have said is, I'm so glad we did do it. Because had they not, life would have been a lot different. And that <laughs> you don't ever want to say that something bad that you did, uh, you know, how great it was that we did it. But again, God causes all things to work together for good. Now, consider this. The boys are going back to their father. And they're going to tell him that Joseph lives and they need to go down to Egypt. How are they going to con explain to their father that Joseph lives? Are they going to lie to him? Because if they do, and Jacob gets to Egypt and talks to Joseph and find out what hap finds out what happens, then they're going to be in more trouble because they lied. So how are they going to break this news to 
Jacob about how Joseph got to Egypt? Well, the fact is, you know, you can lie about anything if you don't have witnesses. <laughs> but Joseph is a witness as to what happened. Now, whether he would have told his father, but if his father had come to him and said what happened, Joseph would have told him. It never tells us how they broke that news to the dad. But I wonder if that's, I wonder, because that's all we can know, if that's why he said don't quarrel on your journey. Don't quarrel about how you're going to handle this. In other words, man up. Do what you need to do. Be honest. That's a good point. It never talks about that in Scripture, but he said they traveled 250 miles with all this food and all these provisions, the best of Egypt. And you would think that with people starving, they would have, there would have been highway robbers. But they were obviously, I don't know. I don't know if they had guards. I don't, it doesn't say that. But obviously they were protected. God protected them, if nothing else. That's up left up to, uh, I was going to say our imagination, but more appropriately, we'll ask God when we get to heaven. <laughs> but clearly they made it, so God protected them. In Genesis 45, it says, then they went up to Egypt, up from Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father, Jacob. Anybody know where their father was, where he's living at this time? He's living in Hebron. Okay. They told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and indeed he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. It says, but he, Jacob, was stunned, for he did not believe them. I mean, it's been... Well, Joseph's 39, so it's been 22 years since he lost his son. And now to hear that he's alive and that he's the ruler of Egypt? I mean, nobody could anticipate something like that. Nobody. It says in verse 27, when they told him all the words of Joseph that he had spoken to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry them, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. Then Israel said, it is enough. My son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. I, he knew what he sent his sons away with, and now they've come back with all this stuff that they could never have unless they stole it or unless it was given to them and the story is true. You might question what one son tells you, but not 11, one of which is Benjamin, your favorite. So he believed. He said, I will go and see him. So they left. So Israel set out with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba. You saw that on the map. Not very far. Uh, it's a 45-minute drive, so it's not very far. And offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. He said, here I am. He said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again, and Joseph will close your eyes. What a promise. It is actually these verses that we're going to focus on for a little while here because they're very powerful. Jacob has left Hebron and he's going to Beersheba to do what? That's right. Promises were made to Abraham and Isaac there. They had worshipped there. They had lived there. It was here that he was coming to, you might say, to be with God. Sometimes when we really need prayer, we really need an answer from God, we go up front in church and have somebody pray for us. But we go to church. I talked to somebody who had made really bad mistake years ago and she needed to go confess it before the Lord and she came to church on a Sunday afternoon and just went up to the altar on her own because she needed to go to a place of God to worship and to deal with what she was dealing with and so that's undoubtedly why I went to Beersheba because this is where a place where he could worship God and it's here that he does he not only worships God but God speaks to him now Consider, let me, let me show you something before I deal with this. A couple of verses in Genesis 28 and then in Genesis 35. When Jacob was leaving the promised land in Bethel, 
God appeared to him in Bethel in the form of a ladder. And he re reiterated to him the covenant that he had promised to Abraham and Isaac and that it would go through Jacob. That was in Genesis 28. What he said to Jacob was, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your descendants. Then when Jacob came back from, Mary, from living with Laban for umpteen years, 20 years, and marrying Leah and Rachel and the assistants, the maids, when he came back, he came back to Bethel and he worshiped God there. And God said to him then, in Genesis 35, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a multitude of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from you. And the land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you, and I will give the land to your descendants after you. Now there's a common denominator that we see in these two verses that God is going to do for Jacob and his descendants. What is that? What? Land. I am giving you and your descendants this land. And Jacob is now leaving that land. Is he supposed to? Is this God's will? Does it, he might not know, or even if he does, he doesn't know this is it, that promise that God made or that prophecy that God made to Abraham in Genesis 15 about going to another land for 400 years. But here is a man of God who's been promised the land that he's living on and now he's going to move to a different country. I mean, he's not just going there for a visit. He's going to live there at least five more years. At least. And he's old. Once you get down there, you don't know if you're going to die and then you don't know what your family is going to do after that. He needs to hear from God. He needs to know God's will for his life regarding this, if this is from God or not. So we have already seen all but, uh, really all but one thing that's required to know the will of God. I think, personally, I rely on five things to know the will of God. One, circumstances. In this case, the circumstances are that there's a huge famine in the land. There's no food. And so you have to make a decision to do something different in order to have food for you and your family. So the circumstances are in play as to the decision that's going to be made. The second thing, and these aren't always in this order, but usually circumstances, the first one. The next one is counsel. It's important to get wise, godly, biblical counsel before you make a decision. Not just going to a friend who's going to agree with you. Oh, your husband's a lousy person. You had to divorce him. No, you want biblical counsel to go through what's, what you're supposed to do. And in this case, it would be Joseph. Joseph is the head of Egypt for all practical purposes. And he has counseled his father to come down to Egypt so that they can take care of him. That's excellent counsel. You can't get... In that world, you couldn't get any better counsel except directly from Pharaoh, and Pharaoh probably didn't have the wisdom to give him that kind of counsel. But to have your own flesh and blood give you counsel, and, and solid counsel, that's the second point. So we have first circumstances, and then counsel. And then, along with that, comes prayer. Now, we don't see Jacob praying here, but we do see him worshiping God. And one tends to believe that because he's going to Beersheba, a virtually holy place for them, that he's doing it to seek God and probably in prayer seeking God also, though it doesn't tell us that. For our practical purposes, prayer is important. We need to be praying about what God would have in store. And then the fourth thing that we see is we need a word from God. In our case, it would be a word from God, from his word, for confirmation that what we're doing is what, what we're going to do is what God wants us to do. In this case, God not only gave him a word, he appeared to him in a vision 
and spoke very clearly to him. And he said, don't be afraid to go down to Egypt. This is my plan for you because I'm going to make you a what? A great nation. Now I'm going to give you some little advance notice. When they went down there, there were 70 people. When they left, how many did they leave with? 600,000 men. So that doesn't include women and children. So you're looking at maybe 3 million people. 70 people to 3 million. Did God make them a great nation? Yes. yes. He knew what he was doing here. God was using the circumstances. He was using the council. He was using everything to get Jacob to go down to Egypt. Even though he'd be giving up the land that was promised to he and his descendants. And we know that he was giving it up for 400 years. That's a long time. You'd think that, you know, if I'm leaving something to my kids, I'm expecting my kids to have it, not 400 years later. So God spoke directly to him and gave him that counsel. And he said, I'm going to go down with you. So I'm there. I'm in the midst of everything that's happening here. Now, when you've had to make decisions, do you seek God's word for an answer? And uh, I happened to be on the pastor search committee when we invited Pastor Kurt to come be our pastor here at church. And he consistently said, I need to hear a word from the Lord. And he did. He did. I'm not going to tell you what it was. You'd have to ask him. As a matter of fact, we were talking about it recently, and, he, and I couldn't remember the verse, but I remembered the, I remember what it said, but I couldn't remember the tagline. And he didn't remember what it was. And then when we talked about it, he said, oh, yeah, I do remember. God very clearly spoke to him in a verse and said, you need to go to Omaha. How about you? I, I've thought, I thought of several in my life when um, our oldest son was born with major, major, major medical problems. And uh, he was getting ready to go into surgery. And I was scared to death to let him go into surgery. And I was a basket case. I don't cry. I was bawling. I couldn't get out of bed. I was so upset. And I ran, I don't know why I was able to read the word, because usually you can't at something like that, but I ran across Matthew 10, 37, that said, he who loves father or mother or son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And at that moment, I loved Bob more than I loved God. I, I, at least, I didn't trust God with him, because I, I didn't want to give him up. And that verse broke me. God spoke to me, and he said, go through this surgery. He'll be okay. That's what I heard. Actually, God did better. He never needed surgery. So that was even better. But the point is God will speak to us. In Deuteronomy 32, 2, there's a great verse there, at least it was for me, about teaching. Uh, God said, let your words be, and let me read it to you. Let my teaching drop as rain, my speech distilled as the dew, as the droplets on the fresh grass, and as the showers on the herb. That spoke to me about God wanting me to teach clearly spoke to me. Now, I wasn't looking for a word from God as to what he wanted me to do, but that's what he spoke to me on. Do you ask God for confirmation for a word from him in a direction that you're going when you want to know God's will? Because if you don't hear a word from God, it may not be God leading you in that direction. We, uh, during the pastor search committee, we, had, we interviewed one particular candidate, another one besides Kurt, and we said, is God leading you to be the pastor of this church? It's a pretty simple question. But you know what? If God's not giving you a word, if, he's, if you're just using circumstance and counsel and, these, uh, and prayer and these other things without hearing a word from God, be careful. It, the person came back. Call, let us know, call us a week or two later and said, he is not leading me to be the pastor of this church. You've got to ask God. Otherwise, it's us making our own decisions. So number four of how you know God's will is hearing a word from God. And then number five, when you have those first four, then you will have number five. And number five is peace you will know that this is the direction you are to go in. And then you are free to go. My opinion is if God gives me an answer to all those four and he gives me the peace, then it doesn't matter what happens. 
if I get an, an, you know, if I'm convinced I'm supposed to go somewhere and I get an airplane and I die, I had the peace about doing God's will and that was his will that I die on that airplane. But I've got to know it was God's will that I do it. Because otherwise, if I don't know that, I can't be assured that what I'm doing is going to be blessed by him or honored by him or give him glory. Jacob needed to know. He was giving up, potentially giving up, his heritage, God's covenant promise to him about this land. And he needed to know from God that this was God's will. And God showed him that it was his will. Now, who would think that it was God's will that your, your descendants are going to go into slavery for 400 years? But that had to happen. Had to happen. So ask yourself, I hope you wrote those five things down. So, no, if you want to know God's will, circumstance, counsel, prayer, hearing a word from God, directly from God. Now, it could be in a vision. Obviously, God can speak that way, but I'm more, you know, God's word is infallible. It's, it's uh, inerrant, and God speaks through his word to us. So that's, that's important. And then finally, that peace. If you're looking for God's will, those are five aspects you need to have. And Jacob had them. So he could go down to Egypt in peace. Oh, I gave you the verse in Exodus 12, 37. It says, The sons of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, aside from children. That's when they left Egypt, 400 years later. So they went from 70 people to 600,000 men, really about 3 million people or more. God took care of them. And God made them a great nation. Right, well, we get that from Exodus chapter 1, where they were so populous that the Pharaoh was afraid of them. Well, that's when they were 3 million people. That was 400 years later. Early on, according to history, there was a group of Egyptians known as the Hyksos. And the Hyksos, well, actually, they weren't Egyptians. They were uh, false people um, that came in and kind of conquered Egypt and took over. And so they would not... This was m hundreds of years before they went out of the Exodus. So it's the Hyksos who probably didn't recognize the value of the Israelites and put them into slavery because they didn't have the connection with the Pharaoh and the famine and everything. So, but the multiple numbers of people and the fear of them uprising, that happened at the time of the Exodus 400 years later. Good comment, good question. All right, where are we? Let's move on to Genesis 46, 5 to 7. Then Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob and their little ones and their wives and the weapons in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry them. They took their livestock and their property, which they had acquired in the land of Canaan, and came to Egypt. Jacob and all his descendants with him, his sons and his grandsons with him, his daughters and his granddaughters, and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. Can you imagine the entourage? That's right. You've got the 70 members of the family that we'll see in a little while, but you also have all the workers, and you have all those animals, and you have all this food and everything that Pharaoh has set for them along the journey. Quite a group going down to Egypt. Now we're going to have some genealogy here, so we're going to run through these next four slides very quickly. It says, these are the names of the sons of Israel, Jacob and his sons who went to Egypt, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, the sons of Reuben, Hanak and Palu, and Hezron and Carmi, the sons of Simeon, Jemuel and Jamin, and Ohad and Jachin, and Zohar, and Shaul, the son of the Canaanite woman, the sons of Levi were Gershom, Koath, and Merari. Those are important to know later on when you get in the book of Exodus and you find out the way they lay out the tabernacle. And when they're traveling, those three sons of Levi are very important. And then it says in verse 12, the sons of Judah were Ur and Onan, and Shelah and Perez and Zerah. Perez is the, where the lineage of the Messiah would go through. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. And the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. 
the sons of Issachar, Tola and Puva, and Lob, and Shimron, the sons of Zebulon, Sarad and Elon and Jaliel. These are the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob in Padam Aram with his daughter Dinah. All his sons and his daughters numbered 33. So that's the first section of people. The sons of Gad, Ziphon and Haggai, Haggai, Shuna and Ezbon, Eri and Arodi and Arili. The sons of Asher were Emna, Ishva, Ishvi, Bariah, and their sister Sarah. And the sons of Bariah, Heber, and Malak, Malkiel. What's the purpose of giving us all this information? We talked about that when we talked about genealogies because Genesis is full of genealogies. First of all, it tells us that every person is important. Here, every member is important. They could, God could have just said, you know, Judah and Perez and the rest of the gang because that was the lineage of the Messiah. But he didn't. Instead, he gave us all of this detail to let us know exactly who it was who went down to Egypt, how they were related, and it showed that each one of them was important in God's eyes. That's very interesting. He says that the, um, I'm not going to explain it all, but he does say that the 400 years and the 430 years are explained a little differently in Genesis elsewhere, where it indicates that those are times both in Egypt and in Cana. So, and then he talked about the difference in the, in the uh, lineage. At least when we look at here, the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, included in that should have been Moses and Aaron. Aaron specifically because he was the high priest. Moses was the leader, but Aaron was the high priest. They're not mentioned there. So then you go to the lineage of Moses and you get more information. So if you want to do all that kind of research, you can come up, as Z has done, you can come up with some interesting information. But the important thing that he said is we have the lineage because it gives us the lineage of the Jews. And that's very important for genealogy's purposes. Okay, now that we've gone through that little rabbit trail, let's move on and read two more slides of genealogy. It says, these are the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to his daughter Leah. She bore to Jacob these 16 persons, the sons of Jacob's wife Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin. Now to Joseph in the land of Egypt was born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, uh, Potiphar priest of On, bore to him. The sons of Benjamin were Bela and Becher, Ashbel, Gira, and Naaman, Ehi and Rosh, Mupin and Huyupin and Ard. These are the sons of Rachel who were born to Jacob. These are 14 persons in all. And finally it tells us, the sons of Dan, Hushim, the sons of Naphtali, Jazriel, Guni, Zerah, Shilon, these are the sons of Bilhal, whom Laban gave to his daughter Rachel. And she bore these to Jacob. These were seven persons in all. All the persons belonging to Jacob who came to Egypt, his direct descendants, not including the wives of Jacob's sons, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two. All the per and of course the idea is that you have Jacob and Joseph also there. So all the persons of the house of Jacob who came to Egypt were 70 people. And even though Joseph was in Egypt, he was considered the house of Egypt, being in Egypt. Uh, the house of Jacob being in Egypt. 70 people going down. Now think back to your generation. I think back, well I can't think back 400 years because I've never done a genealogy. But as I think back, at least uh, as far as I can go, there's no way that our family would have gone from 70 to six, 3 million in 400 years. I mean, that's a huge number. You look at the United States, we've grown exponentially, but not that kind of a percentage. So they did a lot of procreating during that time. <laughs> and of course, they had nothing else to do but procreate. Now, let's move on. Genesis 46, 28 to 30. Now, he sent Judah before him to Joseph to point out the way before him to Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. 
Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. I just can't imagine how emotional that would have been for Joseph. As soon as he appeared before him, he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a long time. It had been 39, what did we say, 70, 22 years since he'd seen his father, and he was his father's favorite. N not to see someone that you love that much, both father and son, but it was Jacob, it was Joseph who fell on his father's neck and wept. I can imagine Joseph, J Jacob did the same. Then Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen your face, that you are still alive. What an emotional time. I, you know, I, I visualize that in the movie <laughs> and how it wouldn't just be a, um, you know, a 30-second reading. It would be a 10-minute, just emotional windfall of those two coming together. Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, My brothers and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me and the men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. So he's going to Pharaoh now to make the plans for their settlement. When Pharaoh calls you and says, and he's talking to his brothers now, what is your occupation? You shall say your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth even until now, both we and our fathers that you may live in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is loathsome to the Egyptians. So there's a real disrespect, you might say, for the Egyptians to the pe keepers of the flock. That's why they would be staying in Goshen. While the land there was so fertile and perfect for livestock, it was far away from the Pharaoh and from the major Egyptian lifestyle. As we move into chapter 47, we're told that Joseph went in and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brothers and their flocks and their herds and all that they have have come out of the land of Canaan. And behold, they are in the land of Goshen. He took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. I would love to know who those five men were. I mean, I would assume it would be Judah and Benjamin because Judah was a leader now and Benjamin was his, his favorite brother. Who knows who the rest would have been, but we don't know. God didn't tell us. Not important. Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? So they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, both we and our fathers. They said to Pharaoh, we have come to sojourn in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, please let your servants live in the land of Goshen. The Pharaoh said, go live in Goshen. Joseph settled them in Goshen. But now, officially, they're coming and asking the Pharaoh's permission to live in Goshen. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is at your disposal. Wow, what a blessing for Joseph and all the Israelites. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them live in the land of Goshen. Now remember, sheep herders are loathsome to Egyptians, but he still wanted them to have the best because of Joseph's reputation, because of Joseph's work and his integrity. One man, one person can make a lot of difference in a lot of lives, and Joseph did. The Pharaoh went on to say, and if you know any capable men among them, among your brothers, then put them in charge of my livestock. So the Pharaoh had livestock. Now Lou had said in class, and he's not here so I didn't get a chance to talk to him ahead of time, that the Egyptians didn't eat meat. And you know, I just kind of went along with it because I didn't know any different. But when I saw this, I thought, well, why is the Pharaoh going to have livestock if they don't eat meat? So I did some research. And they do eat meat. They did eat meat. So I've, I looked up some information. Uh, this first part comes, well, we'll see. The first part comes from a book called The Mountains of the Pharaohs. And it said, meat came from domesticated animals, game, and poultry. This possibly included partridge, quail, pigeons, ducks, and geese. The most important animals were cattle, sheep, goats, and even pigs, though previously thought to have been taboo 
to eat because of the priests of Egypt. So they did eat meat, whether it be bird meat or fish meat or whether it be animal meat. And then it went on to say at the bottom, mutton and pork were most common. So they even ate pork, according to the Oxford Encyclopedia of Ancient Egypt. That explains why the pharaoh had livestock. And now he wants the Jews to take care of the livestock because it's a demeaning job for Egyptians. Makes sense. Get somebody to do it who's good at it and who's comfortable with it rather than people in Egypt that are being forced to do it. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob and presented him to, jo to Pharaoh. Interesting, he didn't bring Jacob first. First he brought the sons. Probably because they needed to all get settled before he brought his older father Jacob. Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Why does Pharaoh need Jacob's blessing? It was tradition that a, a respected person would then bless someone else. And in this case, Jacob is blessing the Pharaoh for all that he has done. It's a way of saying thank you for everything you've done for us and that you are doing for us. But also we know that he's blessing him for the Lord, even though Pharaoh didn't follow the God of the Jews. And by the way, we call them Jews. They weren't called Jews for hundreds of years until they came back from, until they went into exile in 586 B.C. He goes on and says, Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how many years have you lived? So Jacob said to Pharaoh, the years of my sojourning are 130. Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life. Well, you go before the most important person in the world at that time and you complain? My life's been terrible, unpleasant. It looks pretty pleasant to me. You've got four wives and... Lots of children and grandchildren. You've got all these livestock. You've got God on your side. What do you have to complain about? And I thought about us. Our kids, maybe grandkids, are the most depressed in the world, the most depressed that we've ever seen in the United States. They have everything. They don't have to work for anything. A lot of it, yeah, that is the problem. We don't make them work for a lot of stuff. And then when we went through COVID and after COVID, people didn't even want to work. Our kids are spoiled and rotten. That's so sad that we've allowed that to happen. But um, the point is, our kids are complaining. They've got everything they could ever want, and they complain. We have more psychiatrists and more psychologists and counselors than this country has ever seen before because people are so depressed and more people taking drugs for depression. <laughs> you know, if you've got an issue, let's deal with it. You know, deal with it, put it behind you and move ahead and look at what you have, not at what you don't have. Look at your possibilities instead of your problems. That's what we need to do. We need to kind of get people and go <laughs> instead of babying them. Now, I'm not a counselor, so I, <laughs> I had a choice when I went back to school to go into business or counseling. I'm glad I chose business. <laughs> I've always been business-minded, and counseling is not mine because I'm, um, I won't say I'm not sympathetic, but I just I want people to stop blaming other people. I want them to take responsibility for their own lives and look for what they have. Look at the positives instead of the negatives. Here we have Jacob looking at the negatives. He says, hasn't lived enough years, and it's been unpleasant. And then it says, nor have they attained the years that my fathers lived during the days of their sojourning. Oh, boy. Gosh, my dad lived to be 90. I guess I might only live to be 85. Poor me. I mean, come on. Let's be grateful for the years that we do have, not for the years that we wish we had more of. And why would he want more years? Because he's unpleasant anyway. God has given us X number of years in this life, and we don't know what they are. He has a purpose and a plan for each one of us. He wants us to know him, love him, be glorified. Glorify him is what he wants. And we can live the best lives ever. Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. That doesn't mean everything's going to be a rose garden. When I became a believer, I thought, Wow, everything's just going to be perfect from here on out. Not. 
I had a lot of growing to do, but there's, you know, we still live in a sinful world with sinful people. But make the most of it. Jesus did. He didn't even have to come to this earth, but he chose to, and he made the most of it. Sorry, got off at a tangent there, but <laughs> I think of Jacob as one of the patriarchs, our, one of our patriarchs of our founding beliefs, and he's complaining to Pharaoh of all people. But then it, Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt and the best of the land in the land of Ramses as Pharaoh had ordered. Joseph provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to their little ones. So that almost told me, God, I mean, Joseph provided everything they needed. But it doesn't say they got an abundance. They got what they needed according to the number of people they had. So Joseph didn't just pour out stuff on them. He rationed it with them just as he did with everyone else. I'm sure he was, maybe had his finger on the scale with his family that maybe they got a little bit more, but they were rationed just like everyone else was rationed. He didn't show, he was honorable to them, but he didn't show them favoritism that wouldn't have been right when other people were starving. So they are now all in Egypt. I almost wish we were going on to Exodus because it's, to me, the first part of Exodus is so much fun to read as to what happens after 400 years. But they're in Egypt now. We know they'll be there for 400, 430 years, and they will become slaves by the time their sojourning in Egypt has ended. It's not going to be easy for them. Just a side note here. We don't have it here, and we don't have it in the study, but why would God leave them for f there for 430 years? Well, one is he told us, we read it tonight, that he wanted to make them a great nation. And you only become a great nation if you have people, and you only get people if you have time to have people. So that's clearly one reason. That's actually the only reason we really see. Now, let's see what happens to the rest of Egypt. It says, now, there was no food in all the land because the famine was very severe. So the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. What would have happened to Israel if they had stayed in Canaan? There's no way. If God hadn't been gone before that family, if God hadn't taken these angry, jealous brothers and sold Joseph into slavery, if things hadn't worked out, with Potiphar and with the Pharaoh and all that, they would have been wiped out, like a lot of other people were wiped out. God went before him. God knew, and Joseph knew that because he said several times, God meant this to happen. It says in Genesis 47, 14, Joseph gathered all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh became a very wealthy person. He had all the money in the land. But what do you do when you run out of money? Next thing they did was they sold their livestock. When the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food, for why should we die in your presence? A little extreme, but it really wasn't. For our money is gone. Then Joseph said, give, us, give up your livestock, and I will give you food for your livestock since your money is gone. Okay, I'm going to buy your livestock. Makes sense. That's what they had. That was what they owned was livestock, and so he's going to buy it so they could live. The, yeah, where, where's Joseph's mercy? Why isn't he more lenient to the people rather than the Pharaoh? But who's his boss? His boss is the Pharaoh. We're supposed to honor our bosses. We're supposed to do the best for them. I agree that there's, there's a lack of mercy in here for helping the people, but uh, he's obviously being a very good businessman, but it's, by the time it's over, it's really going to hurt the people. Really going to hurt the people. Now they've lost their money and they've lost their livestock, which is their way to make money, whether it's uh, cows for milk or whether it's meat or whatever, or for their family to eat. Now they've lost that. But what do you do when you're destitute? 
You have, you can either make money or you sell stuff. What else is there? To, or you steal, but they, they, they weren't going to get away with that in Egypt. So I, those are the only couple things I can think of. And they're in a, they're in a bind. So Joseph took their livestock. Um, you bring up something, though, that I've just kind of never thought about, which is um, Joseph is a believer in God. You'd think he would have been more merciful to the people. But maybe he was merciful in doing things this way so that they would have grain. I don't know. They were willing to give it up. They were willing to sell it. Well, then it says in Genesis 47:17. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses and the flocks and the herds and the donkeys. And he fed them with food in exchange for all their livestock that, that year. That's a lot to lose. When that year was ended, they came to him the next year and said, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent and the cattle are my Lord's. There is nothing left for my Lord except our bodies and our lands. They've lost it all because of the famine. Genesis 47, 19. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we and our land will be slaves to Pharaoh. So give us seed that we may live and not die, and the land may not be desolate. So they want to give themselves as slaves and the land to Pharaoh, and then they want seed in exchange so they can make food for themselves on that land. And Joseph is going to make a bargain with them. He says, so Joseph brought, bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every Egyptian sold his field because the famine was severe upon them. Thus the land became Pharaoh's. Pharaoh owns everything now. Very wealthy man, but also... <laughs> If Joseph wasn't wise in the things that he was doing, there could have been a real rebellion by the people at that point. It says, as for the people, he removed them to the cities from one end of Egypt's, the, Egypt's border to the other so he could take better care of them and make sure they had grain. But it says, only the land of the priests did not buy, for the priests had an allotment from the pharaohs, and they lived off the allotment which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have today bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is your seed for you, and you may sow the land. I'm reminded of a statement that's come out of the World Economic Forum lately that says, You will own nothing and be happy. Now I'm not going to go into what all that means, but basically there's a large group of powerful people in this world that is trying to take control of everything. And we will come to a point just like they are here. They owned, owned nothing, and yet they were happy to have grain to live off of. And something's going to happen, or at least that's the goal of the World Economic Forum, that something does happen so that we are just happy to have them taking care of us even though we will own nothing. We will literally be subservient to them. This is exactly what happened in Egypt, and that's what we may be seeing here. At the harvest, you should give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four-fifths shall be your own for seed of the field and for your food and for those of your household and as food for your little ones. So they have nothing, they own nothing, but they do get four-fifths of what 80% of what they produce. So they will have food, they will survive. And they obviously are doing this on their land. They don't own the land anymore, but they're going to be doing this on their land so they have access to that land. So in verse 25, they said, You have saved our lives! <laughs> it's amazing how our perspective changes when circumstances change. I believe there will come a time when we'll be happy just to have food and not own anything. And we'll say, Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's got to be really dire for that to happen. But they weren't mad at Joseph or the Pharaoh. They were grateful that they had food. So they said, you have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's slaves. 
Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt, valid to this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth, only the land of the priest did not become Pharaoh's. Now, it never tells us that the people became slaves to Pharaoh, but clearly they offered themselves. Clearly the Pharaoh could do with them what they wanted to, what he wanted to, but it doesn't tell us what happens there. Now, Israel lived in the land of Egypt in Goshen, and they acquired property in it and were fruitful and became very numerous. All I can think of is, is um, the Jews, when they were taken captive into Babylon, when it was time where they were freed to go back into the land of Israel, they didn't want to because they were comfortable there. And they had homes and they had luxuries and they, were, they weren't used to having to fend for themselves back in the homeland. So they stayed in Babylon and only 49,000 people went back into Israel. I read this and I think, Israel became comfortable. They acquired property, became fruitful and very numerous. They were comfortable. Why would they leave Egypt and go back home? They could have. When the famine ended, they could have gone back home, but they didn't. You look at Jews who have become comfortable in Europe and now are being persecuted nearly as bad as they were at the Holocaust, but they became comfortable there and they don't want to leave. Same thing in the United States, and yet the anti-Semitism worldwide is raising up against them. So it tells us in verse 28, Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. When the time for Israel to die drew near, he called his son Joseph and said to him, Please, if I have found favor in your sight, place your, now your hand under my thigh and deal with me in kindness and faithfulness. Why is he putting his hand under his thigh? That's how they made a solemn oath. That's, that was tradition. We've seen it before in Genesis, and that was tradition. Please do not bury me in Egypt, but when I die, when I lie down with my fathers, you shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in the burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said. He said, swear to me. So he swore to him. Then Israel bowed in worship at the head of his bed because he knew he would not die in Egypt. Now it tells us in that previous verse, those previous verses, that he was uh, in Egypt for 17 years. So the famine was long over. Why didn't he go home then? Maybe because Joseph was in charge of the country still, and he was providing all of their needs. If they go back home, it's going to be different. Who knows? But they didn't leave. We know it was God's plan that they stay, and they did. They stayed in Egypt, and they were taken care of for a long period of time until we're told in Exodus chapter 1 that a new pharaoh rose who did not know Joseph or what he had done for the country, and so he put the Jews into slavery. You never know what the future holds. That's why it's important to always seek God in everything we do because he knows the future. So I hope you learned at least, if nothing else today, you learned how to seek the will of God and the importance of it. Because had Jacob just gone down to Egypt on his own and it had not been God's will, things could have been a lot worse for the Jews than they were. When they came out 400 years later, they not only were a great nation, but they had great wealth because they went and asked the Egyptians for items and they gave them gold and all kinds of things that they left and took with them in the wilderness. They didn't steal it, it was given to them. And they needed that as they moved into the new territories. Let's pray. Father, thank you for teaching us so much in the life of Joseph. Thank you for showing us integrity of a man who sought you, the way you used him. We have so many questions about why he did what he did with the Egyptians. So many questions about life through him and what he and his family went through. But you were faithful to your promised covenant people to take care of them at a time when they needed that. They might have died. They might have died off. The lineage of the Messiah might have died off if you had not prepared the way for Joseph to become a slave and go to Egypt. You always have a plan. That's why we need to seek you first, your kingdom and your righteousness. 
because our ways are just our ways and we have no guarantee that they're the right way. So show us, if any of us here are looking for your direction, your will in a certain thing, I pray that you will show us your answer through your word, primarily through prayer, through counsel, through circumstances, and finally through peace that you give us, knowing that we are walking in, a, in your way for your glory, not for just what we want to do. It's so important, Father, that we follow you in everything. When we do, we see you do miraculous things as you did with Joseph and his family in Egypt. We pray, Father, that you will touch our hearts with this and teach us how you would have us live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining Living Word Ministries. Living Word Ministries is a viewer-supported program. Please visit www.livingwordministry.org for more Bible studies and information. And please join us again for Living Word Ministries.